Restoring a Bing clockwork train, part 6, making the buffers for the engine and tender. I want to make the heads of the buffers half an inch in diameter, so I looked in my box of steel, but I couldn't find a piece that was the right size. So in this clip, I'm turning down a piece of three quarters of an inch diameter steel to half an inch. I'm letting the chips build up around the work on purpose. This is a serious health and safety warning for beginners. You must never remove the swarf using your fingers like I'm showing in the video. For two reasons. One is the swarf is very sharp indeed, and it's also very hot. The best way to remove it is by using a pair of pliers. When I'm taking heavy cuts on pieces of steel, I generally use steam oil to lubricate it. Because steam oil still lubricates at a high temperature and it sticks to the work, unlike the WD-40 that I've just sprayed on there, which just immediately evaporates into smoke. And in a small home workshop, I don't think it's a very good idea to breathe in this smoke. Industrial coolant is best, it's a mixture of water and oil in an emulsion. But I don't like using that because it smells horrible. And it reminds me of my electronic engineering apprenticeship. It was the company policy to stick all the apprentices in the engineering shop, drilling the holes in the lids of the cases that took the electronics. I never did like mass production, and the strong smell of coolant on a daily basis drove me mad. So I never really got to do any electronics training. I learned about electronics by teaching myself, which is generally the way I do most things. Formal training in electronics, or metalwork or whatever, is a good thing. Unfortunately, I never had the time for it. Besides, I like to learn by doing it. If you do it wrong, it doesn't work, so you automatically learn that that's not the way to do it. Once I turned the piece of three quarters of an inch diameter steel bar down to half an inch, I chopped off a length of it using my metal cutting bandsaw, and here I have the piece in the chuck. I cut the piece slightly larger than I wanted it. Also, I cut the bar slightly longer than I needed it, so this is a three quarters of an inch diameter part that I'm turning down to half an inch to match the rest. In this clip, I'm taking quite heavy cuts, and as you notice, once again, the swarf is mounting up around the work. This is a dangerous situation, because if this swarf catches in the chuck jaws, what's going to happen is it will suddenly fly around, and if you're stood in line with the chuck, you're very likely to be hit by some of it. I speak from experience, and I must say that it's a painful experience. And now, whenever I'm turning bar stock, like you've just been watching, I always stand to the right-hand side of the chuck, out of the line of fire. With a suitable piece of steel in the chuck, which is half an inch in diameter, I'm now going to start making the buffers. And this involves some more turning of the steel bar, which is now half an inch in diameter, down to 4.8 millimeters, so that the buffer will fit into the buffer stock. Instead of using a micrometer, it's simpler to use the original buffer stock to tell me when I'm down to 4.8 millimeters. I'd like to just mention something very rudimentary that I figured out many years ago. If you're turning a piece of steel bar to be an accurate fit in an existing component, like a buffer stock, please bear in mind that the part that you're machining gets very hot, and metal expands when it's hot so it gets bigger. And this often frustrates beginners because they cut things under size. It's a good idea to let the part cool before taking the final finishing cuts. And in the short time it's taken me to explain the fundamentals of the coefficient of linear expansion, I've centre drilled the end of the first buffer shank, and then I drilled it tapping size for 7BA. And in this clip I'm carefully threading the buffer shank using a 7BA tap. And now a milestone has been reached, it's time to part off the first buffer. And you will notice that I'm leaving the head of the buffer much thicker than it needs to be. I would normally use lubricant for this part of the job, but for the purposes of the video, I'm doing it dry. I made three more of these buffers, but I'm not going to bore you with that because slipping into a coma is only just around the corner. And what am I doing here? Well, this is a piece of half inch steel left in the chuck and I'm using this carbide tipped round nose tool as a form tool. I've ground it slightly concave on the cutting edge, so I'm just seeing what sort of a job it makes of the buffer heads. And at this point I'd just like to mention that if you're actually grinding carbide tip tools, you cannot use an ordinary grinding wheel, because the carbide tip tool will just wear the grinding wheel away. You need to use a green grit wheel. In this clip you can see the four buffers fitted into the buffer stocks, 
They need a little bit more work yet, but they're just about the right thickness, and I think they look OK. Until now, the smallest buffers that I've ever made were for a 5-inch gauge bottle steam locomotive. These are very small, but the principle is identical to making larger ones. Now it's time to clean up the heads of the buffers and make them shine. I'm using one of these superb Proxon rotary tools for this job. And by spinning the buffer onto various grades of sandpaper, in no time at all I can remove all of the tool marks left from the form tool. In order to spin the buffers, I fitted a 7BA stud from an old Stuart steam engine in the chuck and screwed the buffers in turn onto that. And here they are. I never wanted them to be polished. Polished buffers to me don't look good. They need to have some machining marks, but scale machining marks, which is obtained by using emery cloth and wet to dry sandpaper. The machining marks left on the buffer heads from the machining operation were far too deep. Here are the buffers temporarily fitted to the front of the engine. And after I've mounted the buffer stocks permanently to the buffer beam, I'm going to paint the buffer beam and the buffer stocks followed by fitting the buffer heads with a suitable spring inside. And that's about it for this episode. I'll leave you with this side view of the engine body and the tender. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.